Welcome everyone to this video on Macbeth Act 5 Scene 1. We're going to focus on the start of this scene today, um, but we're also going to fill in the gaps of what happens between Act 3 Scene 2 and Act 5 Scene 1, so that we know the plot that happens between these two scenes, and then we can consider the character of Lady Macbeth from there. What we are going to be focusing on is how is Lady Macbeth's character presented in this scene, and what I'm looking for is to understand what happens at the beginning of Act 5, Scene 1, to consider how Lady Macbeth acts differently to how we've seen her in previous acts, and to consider how Lady Macbeth's character now shows weakness, whereas previously we only really saw strength. Before we jump in to our analysis of Act 5, Scene 1, it's really important. In Act 3, Scene 4, we see that those murderers are able to pass on that information to Macbeth. They explain how they managed to kill Banquo, and they also explain that Fleance managed to get away. Macbeth is disappointed that Fleance managed to escape, but he does reassure himself that at least there's no immediate threat from Fleance, because Fleance is a child. We then see Macbeth going to the banquet that they've organised. And at this banquet, he looks around for a seat, and he can't see an empty seat. His wife says, take a seat, and he tells her that he can't because there isn't one that's empty. And at that moment, he notices that one of the seats is taken by the ghost of Banquo, and that's why he thought all of the seats were taken. Nobody else can see the ghost of Banquo but Macbeth. And this really shakes him. Lady Macbeth tries to calm him down, however, Macbeth is visibly shaken by that. The ghost then vanishes. It disappears completely. But Lady Macbeth can see that Macbeth has been hurt by something in some way. So he asks everybody, she asks everyone to leave. At that moment, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth start to discuss how Macduff seems to be staying away. Macduff isn't coming to the banquet for a particular reason. Now Macbeth needs answers, he wants to know what's going on, so he decides that in the next day he's going to go and see the witches because he needs some answers. In Act 3, Scene 5, we see Macbeth. In Act 3, Scene 6, one of the other thanes, the thane of Lennox, this moves us on to Act 4, Scene 1. And in this scene, we see in Act 4, Scene 2, we see that Lady Macbeth is worried but why her? In Act 4, Scene 3, we see what's happening in England, and we can see Macduff. That leads us up to the final act, Act 5, and this is the first scene of Act 5. It takes place in Lady Macbeth's apartments, so this is a very private space. We've seen how she acts in front of other people. This is where she is in a place of where she is supposed to be comfortable, a very private, secure place and enter a doctor of physic. So we see a medical practitioner come into this room, and he has come to see a waiting gentlewoman. The waiting gentlewoman is like the servant girl who attends Lady Macbeth at night. The doctor says, I have two nights watched with you, but can perceive no truth in your report. When was it she last walked? So the doctor has been called into this place by the gentlewoman who is worried about Lady Macbeth. And the doctor has been watching what happens over two nights. And so far, he hasn't seen what the gentlewoman has reported. And what the gentlewoman has reported is that Lady Macbeth is walking in her sleep. She's sleepwalking. And the doctor then asks, when was it she last walked? The gentlewoman then explains. Since his majesty went into the field, I have seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed. Yet all this while in a most fast sleep. The gentleman, gentlewoman is worried about Lady Macbeth. And the fact that we've got a doctor there at all shows that Lady Macbeth needs help. We've never seen Lady Macbeth needing help before. She's always been furiously independent. She derides other people for needing help. Here, she seems to be ill in some way. So she's no longer as independent as she was. 
we find out when her sleepwalking began. And a more impressive word for sleepwalking we can use is somnambulism. So this sleepwalking has started since Macbeth went into the field. And this reveals that Lady Macbeth becomes weaker when Macbeth is not there. It's almost like she needs him around in order to maintain her strength. And as soon as he disappears, then she starts to crumble. Then she starts to become weaker. We learn that she has been rising from her bed. And if we consider a bed as a symbol of a place of rest and comfort, the fact that she cannot stay in her bed, the fact that she cannot stay asleep, shows that she is suffering. And she's suffering because of what she's done. She isn't allowed rest. She isn't allowed comfort because of the evil deeds that she has committed. And if we consider the fact that she should be in her bed, but she's not, beds are places of warmth and security. And yet she's moving away from warmth and security because she's denied those comforts because of her actions. This is almost like the retribution of what she's done. She has to pay the price for her deeds, and that means no comfort at all. And each night she throws her nightgown upon her. Think about how little protection that is against the cold and the dark. She has a thin piece of cloth between her and the rest of the world. And that makes her sound quite fragile. That makes her sound quite vulnerable. This isn't the woman who wanted to have all of these evil spirits protecting her. Now she almost feels like she has no protection at all, and she's starting to sound quite frail. And what she does every night is she unlocks her closet. The closet is her bedroom. That's a place where she should feel comfort and safety, and also that's a place of secrecy as well. It's like she can no longer remain in this secret, and she has to go out, and these secrets are going to start to disclose themselves from the world. Now, she's not doing this on purpose. What we can see is that she's not in control of herself. In other scenes, she seems in absolute control over everything. She's the master of her mind. Nothing can faze her. She can look at the dead body and not even blink. Now what we can see is that she cannot escape from her past and those thoughts are starting to haunt her. What she does every night is she takes forth paper, folds it and writes upon it. She's taking a piece of paper and she's writing upon it, possibly confessing these deeds, possibly passing on information that she shouldn't be passing on. Now, she's not giving that to anyone. She's sealing it and she's taking it back to bed with her. But to write down any sort of confession or any sort of uh, information that could implicate her in the murder of Duncan is a very dangerous act because other people could easily read what's on those pieces of paper. Someone could find that piece of paper and then everyone will know what's happened. And in lots of Shakespearean plays, when someone writes something on a piece of paper, it can often be taken and it can reveal secrets that aren't supposed to be revealed and it can be a very, very dangerous action. There is no reason for Lady Macbeth to be writing anything down. What's happened is she's become illogical. Think about how logical she was in the past. She wasn't scared of dead bodies because they look like they're sleeping. She's able to make her mind look at things in a certain way. Here, Lady Macbeth has lost that logical action. She can no longer think clearly, and now she's doing things for no rational reason. So she reads it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed, yet all this while in a most fast sleep. She is not doing this while awake. She is fast asleep, which shows that she is not in control of her actions. So whilst we've seen when she's awake, she can conquer her thoughts. And earlier on, she was able to deal with all of that. We started to see her doubt creep in in Act 3, Scene 2. Now we can see that all of that guilt is ruining her ability to sleep. And it's also making her act in a way that she shouldn't be acting. After that long list of things that are happening with Lady Macbeth in her speech, the doctor then explains a great perturbation in nature to receive at once the benefit of sleep and do the effects of watching. In this slumbery agitation, 
besides her walking and other actual performances, what at any time have you heard her say? The doctor can see that this is not natural behaviour, that something is causing a problem here. Something is disturbing the way things ought to be. And this links back to the fact that Lady Macbeth and Macbeth have caused a problem in nature. Nature has been disturbed because they took the king from the throne where his rightful place was. And now Lady Macbeth and Macbeth are in a place they should not be. They are king and queen where it is not their place to be so. God has not put them on the throne, they put themselves on the throne. So whilst Lady Macbeth is acting in a strange way, it could possibly be because the divine right of kings has been subverted. Because they have done such evil, all of nature is now all mixed up and in chaos. We then see when the doctor says in this slumbery agitation, he describes Lady Macbeth's sleep as slumbery agitation. Slumbery means to be asleep. Agitation means to be awoken. Here we've got the oxymoron to show that Lady Macbeth gets no sleep, or no rest at least, in her sleep. It shows that perhaps she doesn't get the rewards of sleep because she doesn't deserve them. Perhaps her lack of ability to rest and lack of ability to sleep are the punishment of her for doing such evil deeds. You can't get away with the murder of Duncan without any sort of retribution. Here, she has to pay for what she's done. We then hear the gentlewoman respond to his question by saying, that, sir, which I will not report after her. The gentlewoman refuses to tell the doctor what she's been saying in her sleep. And that's because it's likely that Lady Macbeth has revealed her secrets. The gentlewoman won't tell the doctor because Lady Macbeth could get into serious trouble and the gentlewoman therefore might get into trouble too. So she refuses to tell the, dun uh, to tell the doctor what those um, speeches were. And this shows that Lady Macbeth is no longer in control. Now when we've seen Lady Macbeth in the past, she's very good at putting on an act or putting on a performance. She will look a certain way but act differently. It links back to the quote about how Macbeth needs to look like the innocent flower but be the serpent underneath it. Here it shows that Lady Macbeth cannot keep up that facade. She can't keep up that mask when she's asleep. When she's sleeping she cannot deceive people so everything is released. The doctor then says you may to me and tis most meet you should. So the doctor says look tell me what's happened. Lady Macbeth says neither to you nor anyone having no witness to confirm my speech. The gentlewoman does not want to tell anyone what she's heard because it could put her in a very difficult position. Lady Macbeth then enters and in her hands she's holding a taper. A taper is the smallest candle and if you imagine the scene, you imagine the staging, we've got this dark scene in front of us in the dead of night and then you've got this tiny, insufficient light trying to light up this room and clearly fa failing. You've got a clear juxtaposition between the two images. A woman who's become quite frail, desperately clinging on to this last little bit of light. And then you've got this large, overwhelming, suffocating darkness of the room that's ready to extinguish that light at any moment. Now we can look at this in quite a few ways. One, we could look at this as her being afraid of the dark now. She is scared to look at what she's done in the world. And now she doesn't want to face the repercussions of her actions. So she's desperately holding onto this light because it helps to protect her from the darkness. We can also look at this in a different way. This light could represent moral goodness and innocence. And it's almost like she's desperately trying to hold onto that tiny little part of her that might still be considered good and yet she's ultimately failing because there is not much light left and at some point this light is going to be extinguished forever and she is going to be completely lost. It is going to be impossible for her to be a good person from now even if she's holding on to this desperate tiny little bit of semblance of hope. Lo you, here she comes. This is her very guise and, upon my life, fast asleep. 
observe her stand close. The doctor asks, how came she by that light? Why, it stood by her. She has light by her continually, tis her command. You see her eyes are open? Ay, but their sense are shut. We can see that when the gentleman explains why she has this light with her, she tells us that Lady Macbeth has commanded her to always have a light by her. That's one of the things that she's put in place. No matter where Lady Macbeth goes, she must have a light. She is desperate to hold on to that light. And that could show that she's desperately trying to recapture the light or goodness in her life. But this is completely different to the Lady Macbeth we saw much earlier on in the play. Earlier on, she was commanding the spirits so that she could operate in the darkness and at night time. And now we have a woman who's scared of the dark and desperately wants to hold on to the light. Can you see the clear juxtaposition in her character? Earlier on, she wanted night to hide her so she could do evil. Now she wants the light so that she can still be a good person. And notice the word continually as well. There seems to be no end to her suffering. This light must always be there because the moment it's gone, she's going to be lost. We learn that her eyes are open. So when she is walking around the castle or walking around her room in, in sleep, she's, her eyes are open. And I would argue that there is some irony here. And the irony is her eyes are open and yet she is not seeing clearly. She's not acting the way she was acting earlier. Earlier, she realised that she needed to have her eyes completely open. She needed to assess all situations. She needed to have all of the information in front of her and then act in the right way. Here, she's not acting in the right way. Her eyes are open, but she cannot see anymore. It's almost like she's been blinded by her grief, blinded by, her, um, by the consequences of her actions. The final part on your screen then is the gentlewoman saying, I, but their senses are shut. It shows that Lady Macbeth is no longer in control of herself. She has lost that control. And she's no longer aware of the consequences of her actions. Previously, she made sure she spoke in the right way. She looked the right way. She acted in the right way. Now, she is completely blind to how she should be acting as she's asleep. The doctor then says, what is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. So on stage, we have Lady Macbeth, who's wandering around in her state of somnambulism, and she's rubbing her hands together. Consider how her constantly rubbing her hands shows that she's getting no rest at all. She's very agitated. She gets no relief from sleep. She's constantly haunted by these thoughts and these regrets. The gentlewoman explains it is an accustomed action with her to seem thus washing her hands. I have known her continue in this a quarter of an hour. So the gentlewoman reveals that her rubbing her hands is her washing her hands. And if you think about the religious connotations of washing, we've got that biblical imagery of purity in the Bible. To wash means to cleanse yourself of sins. You know, in Christianity, we have baptisms, christenings, where water is used to wash away sin. And we have ablution as well, again, the idea of dousing yourself with water and therefore cleansing your body to being a good person. It's like Lady Macbeth is trying to wash away her guilt. In the early parts, when we saw Duncan murdered, she thought a little bit of water cleanses us of, of this. A little bit of water to wash it away. Just, you know, a little bit of water to take away the blood. Now she realises it's not the blood that needs to be washed away. When she sees her hands, she sees them red. They look like they are covered in blood. But that's more of a, um, a symbol of her guilt. And now what she's trying to do is to try and get rid of that guilt. And I think one of the major things that Shakespeare tries to show us is that if you commit such horrific acts, you are beyond saving. It's better to not commit the acts in the first place rather than commit them and then trying to wash them away. So you've got this impossible um, image of her trying to wash away or absolve her guilt, and it's simply not possible. I have known her continue in this a quarter of an hour. 
considering the pain that she must be going through every night, washing her hands over and over and over again, her hands would be raw and red. And that shows that she just cannot cleanse herself. She's beyond salvation. She can never escape that fate. So she can't clean her hands. It's almost like that guilt now has stained her and she just cannot get rid of it. The Lady Macbeth we saw earlier on wanted to own that guilt. She didn't feel any sort of guilt at all. And if anything, she was getting frustrated by Macbeth, who was feeling guilty. Now she is paying for those actions. Now she has to deal with these emotions. We then hear Lady Macbeth speaking in her sleep. She says, yet here's a spot. So she's speaking to herself. She doesn't realise that someone else is there. And the word yet shows that that blood still hasn't gone away. That blood remains and it cannot be washed away. She's getting frustrated because the more she scrubs, the less it disappears. And this idea of her having a spot on her hand, it's like her hands are stained. If you consider our hands, our hands are often a place of honesty. If you're being honest with someone when, when we're using our hands as gestures, when we, we tend to put them out palms facing upwards to show our innocence. Here, that place of innocence is stained, it's tainted by her guilt. And when she sees her hands, she sees blood on there. And this is the spot of blood she's referring to. However, there's another interpretation of spot. In the Jacobean um, era, Lots of people believed that evil creatures existed. People believed in witches. James I, the king at the time, even wrote a book about demonology, about witches. He even went to a different country to watch witches being killed. So we've got this idea that Lady Macbeth sees a spot on her hand, and very often people believed that witches or evil creatures would have a spot on there somewhere. And on their body, that spot would show them to be a witch or show them to be a creature of evil. It's like Lady Macbeth can see that she is evil and she's desperately trying to wash that guilt away. And yet it still perseveres. It still stays there. Consider how Lady Macbeth almost is listening to her conscience here. She wants to cleanse herself, whereas earlier on in the text in Act 1, she wanted to get rid of all of her innocence, get rid of all her femininity to become this evil creature. Now she's acting in the opposite way. It's almost like she realises that she got it wrong earlier on. The doctor says, hark, she speaks. I will set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. So the doctor is going to write down her words. Lady Macbeth is about to expose herself. She's about to expose all of the evil that she has done. And the doctor writing it down is going to put her in a very difficult position. Thank you so much for watching this video on Act 5, Scene 1. This is only the first video of this particular scene. It is a bit longer than some of the others, so there will be other videos uh, appearing very, very shortly. Um, hopefully you can see that Lady Macbeth's character is completely different to the evil character who was full of her own self-confidence, who was absolutely independent, who was frustrated by her husband for showing weakness. Now we can see the effects of what she's done and she is no longer in control. She can no longer control those emotions. They seem to be bubble up, bubbling up inside her and she's getting suffocated by all of that feeling of guilt. Okay, um, thank you so much. Have an utterly delightful day. I will speak to you all next time.